name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. I'm Karen Roberts. This is your news at 9 o'clock. 122,186 COVID cases have been recorded in the UK in the latest 24-hour period, marking a third consecutive record day. Elsewhere, figures from the Office for National Statistics show a record 1.7 million people were infected with COVID-19 last week. Amid a steep rise in cases, vaccination centres will be open even tomorrow and Boxing Day as part of a jingle jab campaign. In this year's Christmas message, Boris Johnson is urging people to come forward to get a COVID booster jab. We know that things remain difficult, but for millions of families up and down the country, I hope and believe that this Christmas is and will be significantly better than the last in this vital respect, that we can celebrate together with those we love and raise our glasses to those who can't be with us. The UK is set to offer 12-month visas to social care workers in an attempt to combat star shortages due to coronavirus. The temporary measures will come into effect early next year and are expected to attract thousands of staff. To qualify, migrant workers will need to be paid a minimum annual salary of £20,480. The Queen's Christmas Day message is expected to be particularly personal this year as it's her first since the death of her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. A photograph released by Buckingham Palace ahead of her televised address to the nation tomorrow shows the Queen at Windsor Castle. Her Majesty is accompanied by a single framed photo of her diamond wedding anniversary in 2007. A drug which could halve the risk of death from some prostate cancers may be made available on the NHS. A study published in The Lancet found hormone therapy, abia aterone, could be effective in reducing the death rate of patients from 15% to 7. More than 52,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the UK every year. The most expensive ever telescope is blasting into space tomorrow, 100 times more sensitive than its predecessor, Hubble. The James Webb Space Telescope will be launched on Christmas Day after a delay due to the weather. Scientists hope that it will shed new light on the birth of the universe. That's your news update. I'll be back at 10 o'clock. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. The weather this Christmas is all about the contrast. Cold but bright in the north and east. Rain elsewhere and fairly mild in the southwest. 
And you can see those contrasts on this map. The blues there across northern parts of the UK, whilst milder air affects southwestern areas, and these weather fronts moving in and then stalling through central zones. So for Christmas Eve night, an area of rain moving north across central parts of the country, tending to fizzle out through the end of the night, but leaving a lot of cloud and damp conditions. Heavier rain returns to South Wales and the southwest. Milder here, but for Scotland, clear spells through the night means a frost to wake up to on Christmas Day with temperatures in sheltered spots below freezing. That's where the lion's share of sunshine will be for Christmas Day itself, particularly northwest and west Scotland. Patchy cloud elsewhere. Staying dry, at first at least, for Northern Ireland, for Northern and Central England and East Anglia. Windy in the north, especially over the higher ground, and that will make it feel really quite cold through Christmas Day. Much milder in the southwest, but here it will be wet throughout Christmas Day, as well as for much of Wales, and then increasingly the Midlands, Central Southern and South East England, as well as Northern Ireland. And as this rain moves north during Christmas Day night, it will mix with the colder air, and we're likely to see some snow for the higher parts of northern England, southern and central Scotland. Primarily above 300, 300 or 400 metres. And we're likely to see, with the strong winds, some drifting of that snow. So tricky conditions over some of the higher Pennine routes, as well as for some of the higher routes of central and southern Scotland. First thing, Boxing Day. That weather does fizzle out through the day, however. And it stays dry and bright in the north of Scotland, brightening up in the southwest, also in between showers and it will be cloudy across much of England, Wales and Northern Ireland with outbreaks of rain on and off. Further rain at times on Monday, drying up on Tuesday and turning milder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Merry Christmas. I'm Calvin Robinson and on tonight's Christmas special we'll be exploring the question of what does Christmas mean to you? We'll also be looking at the true meaning of Christmas because here we're not afraid to put Christ back into Christmas. We've got some amazing guests lined up, some beautiful carols, and of course, the nativity story. So stay tuned for all of that. But coming up first will be my Christmas monologue. But I'd like to start as we intend to go on. So here is the very wonderful St. Mary's Choir. <laughs> Happy holidays is a term you will never hear from me. In a sense though, these people are right. If we break down the meaning of the word holidays, it means holy day, then we're closer to the target. However, it's a very specific holy day. It's Christ Mass, the celebration of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph and the, the start of the Holy Family. To Christians, this is one of the holiest days of the year. Consider it the day that God became man incarnate. Quite a big deal. Why is that important in the 21st century? Some might ask, why is it important in Britain? Well, this is still a Christian country. We have an established church, the Church of England, with Lord Spiritual, who sit on our second chamber in Parliament, providing, or at least they should be providing, uh, an element of 
moral scrutiny to the laws of the land. The church established, along with our state, the schooling system. We get our moral values from our Christian faith, our moral compass even. These aren't things that we plucked out of thin air. Many an atheist might say, you know, my morality is nothing to do with Christianity. But our moral values, in this country at least, have evolved through tradition from the Christian faith. It's fair to say that that isn't the same everywhere else in the world. And whether people are religious or not, morals are not innate. There are plenty of countries around the world that do not share our moral values. And culturally, we're also a Christian country still. The fact that the whole country pretty much shuts down at the end of December through into January just signifies how important Christmas is in this country. How much we still celebrate the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Or at least, it was. Every year there's a move to secularize Christianity. Happy Holidays is an Americanization, but it doesn't end there. This year, the EU launched an attack on Christmas, uh, an attack on common sense, you could say, by advising officials and politicians to use the term holiday time instead of Christmas time. Uh, this was supposed to appear more inclusive. Well, thank God we left that failing institution because this pandering is it's just ridiculous. You don't become more inclusive by excluding your own. There's nothing wrong with wishing someone a Merry Christmas or Happy Hanukkah or a peaceful Eid when the time comes around. But that shouldn't mean you can't wish someone a Merry Christmas in December. And wishing them a Merry Christmas isn't pushing your religion on anyone. It isn't even assuming that they are Christian themselves. If I wish you a Merry Christmas, I'm expressing my faith. I'm not pushing it on anybody. You can either acknowledge that or respectfully shrug it off, and that, again, is fine. After all, it's a key British value to respect those of different faiths and non. Inclusivity is one of those messy words that I think is often misunderstood, especially around this time of year. In a Christian context, we often hear it used to mean that we should water down our Christian values and take on board the values of other faiths or other cultures. Removing the cross, for example, and replacing it with a half crescent, or taking down a crucifix and replacing it with the rainbow flag. This is wrong. Inclusivity in a Christian context, in a church at least, should mean that all are welcomed to be changed through an experience with Christ. The faith shouldn't adopt to our modern ideals uh, progressive values aren't inherently good. The faith should offer a positive alternative, shining as a light in an ever-darkening world around us. Christian moral values are absolute, and that's fundamental. While society might shift and waver and change what's appropriate and what's inappropriate one minute, you could get cancelled for saying something that's changed the very next day. Christianity will always be about faith, hope, and love. Our cultural values, our faith, are things that are to be celebrated. And Christmas is one of the most important times to do that. Let's not let the secularists divide us. We're stronger united. God bless and Merry Christmas. Coming up, we have free speech champion Baroness Fox, showbiz icon Patsy Kensit. We have much more from that wonderful choir at St. Mary's. And now, here is Father Mark North. Father, today I'm asking everybody else, what does Christmas mean to them? But I'd like to ask you, what is the true meaning of Christmas? Okay, so the, the true meaning of Christmas is the birth of God's Son, that uh, incarnation, we call it, when God, uh, that uh, great almighty creator, uh, decided to enter into his creation to be born of the Virgin Mary, to be known as the baby Jesus, as we call him at this time of year. And why does that matter? That matters because, because it's something that's never happened before. It, it, it matters because 
um, it's God's plan to redeem the world, to save the world. Um, without him becoming uh, a human being, without him taking flesh, then the whole story of Easter, um, which is not that many months away, I know we're only at Christmas at the moment, but we always end up looking at Christmas through the lens of Easter, to be honest. Um, so that great uh, Easter story of Jesus's death on the cross and his resurrection, uh, without the incarnation, that is not possible. But without the resurrection, then our own hope for eternal life, that promise of heaven, that great um, hope that is at the heart of the Christian faith, it, it just does not exist. So the importance of Christmas is that it points to Easter, and the, the importance of Easter is that it points to heaven, <clears throat> and it points to that uh, that uh, that great um, great sense of eternal life, that sense of giving our own earthly life meaning here as part of that greater journey towards the presence of God. There are those who would say that Christmas has become too commercial or too secularized, you know, with the idea that Santa Claus has replaced Jesus in many households. Is that inherently a bad thing or can we work with that? I think we have to work with it because if you don't uh, understand what the current culture is, you're not going to be able to bring any sort of message about uh, the birth of Jesus into that. Um, I think that Christmas has become uh, a, a great sort of commercial opportunity for lots of people and therefore it becomes a huge focus for everybody's thinking, everybody's planning for months uh, in the course of the year. Um, and it ends up with us all actually anticipating Christmas. Um, here we are just at the threshold of Christmas. Um, whereas for many people, Christmas has almost already happened. It's been that process of decorating houses, buying food, buying presents, starting to eat that food, starting to enjoy that Christmas festivity. Uh, and then it comes to an end uh, on the 26th of December where for the church, that's just the beginning of the whole Christmas celebration. For us, Christmas starts uh, with uh, Christmas Eve, with uh, Midnight Mass, and then flows through into those dark days of January, that, that great sort of light as we get towards the arrival of the kings, the wise men. Uh, and so th the focus in my mind has sort of shifted. We're now so busy celebrating Christmas, we forget to anticipate Christmas. And then when we get to Christmas, we're sort of done and dusted with it within two days. Uh, and that all seems rather sad that all that anticipation has been lost. Um, so I think that that's sort of something that we need to be very uh, aware of, um, that we've, we have lost that sense of proper anticipation, perhaps lost that real sense of the season of Advent, uh, those four weeks that are given to us to prepare for the celebration of Christmas, not to celebrate Christmas uh, during them, but to be thinking about what does Christ's birth actually mean to us, to us as human beings, to the whole human race, to us as individuals in that sense of our own relationship with God. Um, but also, of course, to have a thinking about um, the, the, what, we, what we find in the book of Revelation, for example, you know, the, the second coming of Jesus in that time when the world will be judged and we will all uh, have to stand before him. Uh, and that great, uh, those great themes of Advent get lost uh, in our preparing for, the, for Christmas, to be honest. Absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned the, the time of Advent because we hear a lot these days people saying, how can we describe the period between Christmas and New Year? And, well, that is Christmas. It is. <laughs> uh, we, we tend to think of Advent as Christmas these days. Is there a different way we should be celebrating or preparing throughout Advent in the lead up to Christmas? Should it be more penitential, for example? That's certainly the theme of Advent, is, is, is to be penitential, so to, to be not quite as severe as Lent. I think lots of people are familiar with the concept of Lent, that sense of giving something up for Lent is, has sort of uh, entered into, into, our, uh, into our culture in a way. Um, but, but Advent has those echoes of giving something up, of denying yourself, of, of thinking through your own lifestyle, the choices that you make, acknowledging the need for God, um, reflecting on your conscience, on your lifestyle, uh, and, and then preparing to, to welcome Jesus as he comes among us at Christmas. So it does have that penitential uh, sense to it. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the challenge for us, isn't it? Because that, that, that penitential need is being countered out a lot by the sense of needing to buy things, needing to do things, needing indulgence, to... Indulgence, etc. Yeah, indulgence, yeah. So as a final question, Father, does anyone have the power to cancel Christmas? Nobody has the power to cancel Christmas. 
<laughs> nice and simple. I like it. But you're <laughs> absolutely spot on. Father, thank you very much for celebrating Christmas with us this year. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. That was Father Mark North of St. Thomas Canterbury in Brentwood. Coming up is Baroness Claire Fox, uh, Director of Academy of Ideas, Battle of Ideas, Debating Matters and All-Round Free Speech Champion. Claire, we recently appeared on a panel together discussing our faith. And am I right in understanding that you are a cradle Catholic, but now more of a cultural Christian? Yeah, I wouldn't ever call myself um, anything other than somebody who was reared in the Catholic Church. Um, and if you've been, anyone who's been a Catholic will know this, you're a, forever a cultural Catholic. So it doesn't matter whether you have an attachment to atheism, humanism, whatever it is, you will always be in a situation where you feel like a Catholic. And that's exactly as I feel. And what did that mean for you growing up as a Catholic, especially around Christmas time? Well, I think that, that we, had, we always had a sense that Christmas was about giving. And, you know, sometimes people are very dismissive about presents and, and, and people wrapping things up. And, but actually, that's part of the generosity of Christmas. And, of course, when you're a child, you want to get presents um, from Father Christmas. But you also have a sense that you um, want to give presents. And that sort of um, generosity really was part of our family's tradition. My, my parents were great at encouraging us to buy presents early on, give them, be grateful. I bought presents for all my aunties. You know, you had that sort of sense of it. I still do this, you know, I kind of buy everyone in our office a present every year, which is kind of daft. But because I always associate Christmas with that and I want to say thank you. And I know that's from my Catholic upbringing. I also think that we had a sense that it was religious. We went to mass, we, 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 I, I loved the music. I, I have that great memory of those fantastic hymns. I loved the nativity story. And, and, and not just that I wanted to be in the nativity play at school. Um, I always ended up as a shepherd rather than Mary, I have to say. But nonetheless, I, I loved the story. This idea, which was instilled in me very early on, that God, the King of Kings, became a man. It came down to earth and was a humble man as well. So that was a great humanist because, it, it, you know, what you're basically saying is man is so important that even God will become man. It seemed to me to be a great honour. Now, if you, if you kind of then grow up to be a humanist like me, you, so you can see that very strongly as um, symbolising the way that we put humanity first. And, and that's always stuck with me. And also, I, I really like the idea that, that the great kings came to, to, to this child in a manger. Um, but so did the shepherds. And so that, that was a kind of everyone's equal in front of God. And so, you know, great lefty that I am, that was a bit of egalitarianism. And Mary and Joseph were very humble people. They were refugees, didn't have anything. And yet they were the parents of, the, of God. And so that was important to my family because maybe from a humble background in some ways, they wanted to, to instill upon us that you could be anything and that just because you didn't have great material wealth, that didn't mean that you weren't important. So these are childhood notions that you, that stay with you and which still mean a huge amount to me today. I really love that, the idea that God became man incarnate, emptied himself out, humbled himself for our sake. That's, that's a very Christmassy message. Um, now, I wouldn't describe you, Claire, as anti-woke because I know as much as you battle the woke uh, lobby, you also campaign against the anti-woke people because you're always about nuance and having a good conversation and debating well, as you put it often. Now, do you think the faith and the Christmas story in particular could be a good antidote to a lot of the woke issues that we're seeing in our culture and our society today? So I think that in some ways, religion should be an antidote to identity politics because whichever religion it is actually, but let's stick with Christianity because that's your theme. Christianity is universal in as much as you can go anywhere around the world and people will be celebrating Christmas. And I, I really love that about it as well. And I spent some time in India when I, we took our Debating Matters competition for sixth form to India. We did that for, for years and I, you know, it was obvious, but I, I, I met lots of Catholics there and lots of Christians in India and they had the nativity scenes and all the rest of it. So that was a kind of, that's a great thing. And also it's been celebrated for thousands of years. So you should be able to say that it becomes an antidote. However, two problems. 
Many religions now have joined in the identity politics. So you will have people who say, as a Catholic or as a Muslim or as a Buddhist or as a, you know, they almost kind of like it becomes an identity that you want to compete in the victimhood states for. That's not good. And the institutional church, sadly, has, I'm afraid, rather than being an antidote to wokeness, um, joined the club. They are rather, seem to be rather embarrassed about um, this great historic tradition that they have. When we were concerned, a lot of us, about the pulling down of statues or the flattening out of history, the denunciation of past figures, you would think the church would think, thousands of years old, we can withstand this. No, Church of England has managed to, is doing an audit as we speak, going around its churches looking for old offensive things that you know might upset someone. And there's, there's no way they can win that way, by the way, because everything about the history of Christianity is going to offend someone. I mean, you know, and its history is littered with everything from, um, you know, I mean, think of some of the wars, let alone anything else. So if you're going to start doing that, that's going to be very bad for the church. And I think that because the institutional church has been corrupted over the years, many corruption scandals, the sense of self-loathing could really rot the church from within. I'm with you entirely. We need to, I mean, this is the most scandalous story of all time. And that's a good thing because it's the message that it portrays, like you talked about humility and family and unity and diversity as well uh, across the world. Baroness Fox, thank you very much for joining us this, this Christmas. Thank you for sharing your stories and have a good one. Thank you. God bless. That was Baroness Claire Fox. Coming up next is TV legend, movie star Patsy Kensit. But now, here's the break. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for The Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is The Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world, and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. 
Thanks for being part of the GB News family. In those days, Caesar Augustus issues a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David called Bethlehem. He went to be registered with Mary. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver a child. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in a cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We wish you a Merry Christmas, everybody. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome back. You've seen her on your small screen. You've seen her on the big screen. She is the soap star. She is a movie legend. It is Patsy Kensett. Let's start with a broad question, Patsy. What does Christmas mean to you? Well, I think Christmas really means family. And uh, that is um, delicious. And then when you have your own children and, you know, getting the decorations put up and, and when, when you're growing up doing it, I mean, I came from a quite a poor background so we, we you know it was quite lean um our Christmases but I sort of made up for it with my own sons um and we would uh, you know I'd um I'd do silly things like um a note from Rudolph that um he couldn't find the toilet and I'd put um a banana and cover it with Nutella and put it on a piece of paper, yeah. and and um, then it was Rudolph said, "Sorry, I, I missed the loo." And but the kids every year, <laughs> I mean, up until about you know nine or ten, they just like, they howled, and um, and then we would uh, would sometimes go to midnight mass, um, but sadly for me, my mother um, had had cancer, and she was diagnosed when I was four, right. and she she died when I was twenty two. So she fought the illness. She had her faith that was unquestionable. She was a very devout woman. Mm. So, and her passing is this uh, this weekend. So for me, it's it's um, there's a, a sort of melancholy. Yeah. And and I I'm sorry for my kids sometimes because I think they can sense that that sadness. Which I mean I'm reconciled with it. It, was, it happened so long ago. But she would have been such a huge part of of our christmas days and and uh, you know my kids missed out on a really wonderful woman 
So does that mean that Christmas has two meanings for you? One, yeah. you know, the story of Jesus, but also that relationship with your mother. It yeah. must be a constant reminder. Constant reminder. Mm. Yeah, it really is. And it, I feel it kind of starts creeping up on me towards the end of uh, November. Mm. And and it's funny because my boys, they're, they're men now, but they'll, they'll, they sort of, they said, no, we know this is a difficult month for you, mum, and, and everything. But these things always seem to happen at Christmas. Yeah. Um, I know, I know people die all the time, but uh, it was um, it was very sad. No, it's never easy. Yeah. Did your faith help you throughout that time? Well, you know what, the the church actually really was a huge comfort mm. to me then. I mean, I'm I call myself an a la carte Catholic. I'm oh. a, I went to a convent, and um, both my sons have made their first communion and um, have been confirmed, and they're on their own. You know, journey for their yeah. higher power. Yeah. Um, I there are things about uh, Catholicism that I absolutely love. Uh, I love the pomp and circumstance of the mass. I think it's a wonderful um, experience. Uh, I love the fact that we can go and confess all our sins and, and it wipes the slate clean. Um, but what the the one thing that I, I troubles me sometimes is that the God that I grew up to, you know, to my faith, that God was a fearing God. There's a lot of a lot of guilt, right. um, sort of thrown at us. And I think perhaps it's it's changed some, somewhat now. But uh, I think that I, uh, my understanding of of, of God is, is is a loving entity, and I don't believe that. Um, I think guilt is such a empty emotion, and I'm I'm full of it. <laughs> so, Aren't we all? yes, yes. So, as your relationship, well, as your understanding of God has changed, yes. has that altered your relationship with God then? No. Okay. No. I still say my prayers every night. Yeah. I meditate now, though, like something. But that to me is, it's, it's like praying. And, um, you know, I came in and just saw the, you know, the manger and the baby mm. Jesus. And yeah. I had to take a little, little, bit, of, little bit of straw. Because we used to do that right. every year, every year. So sorry, parish. I took twenty <laughs> bits of I've stolen from from the I'm sure that's from the manger, and um, yeah. I mean, it's the the church has definitely been a great com a, a great comfort to me um, over the years. You sound like you're a lady of traditions. Like yes. You like to continue your traditions. Which ones have you maintained from your childhood that your your children have experienced as well? Well, we didn't. They don't get coal for Christmas. Like we <laughs> I'm we sure so, you never got coal, we did so, you? We really lived in two rooms with an outside toilet till right. I was uh, about ten. So it was, it, you know, but it was fun. We, we my mum made it great. Yeah. Um, but the traditions that I um, have brought forward with the boys. Um, I think we kind of made our own. I think um, because of the, my job and, and, and having had some success and yeah. sort of broken the poverty line, really, um, I was able to, to do so much more. I remember our, our Christmas tree growing up was this poor sort of silver plastic. It, oh, my goodness, it was so, it was so sad. Um, and... You know, I, I lived in a place and I could have, a, you know, a real Christmas tree and, uh, of course, you know, the angel on the top. And then that would be the, my kids would fight, fight about who's going to put the angel on the top, right. which is the same when I, with me and my brother, except our tree was, <laughs> it didn't look very happy. It was a bit, it was a bit sad. Well, you mentioned your career there, and I know yes. you've, you've worked in film and TV and lots of different areas of show business. Yes. But of course, when you're part of a soap, yes. Christmas is a big deal, isn't it? And you record it months in advance. Oh, so, yeah. So what's that experience like? Oh, it's bizarre. I mean, in the summer, you've got to wear scarves and hats and you're absolutely ro roasting. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's such a full sense of, of being, uh, uh, especially in a, a long running drama, because you you know you celebrate all these um, seasons months before they happen, so it it it, it, it kind of does throw you into a bit of a loop, and, and you think, oh my, I only did this four months ago, and we're doing it again um, for real. Uh, but you know that's just part of the job. Yeah, and you've talked about how important your faith is, how yes. important you see Christmas as, um, and you said that your children are on their own spiritual journeys. Yeah. Is it your hope that they'll one day find the faith, the Christian faith? I think that my hope and my um, peace 
mm. that I, I, um, I find is that I know how much the church was there for me when my mother, mm. I don't want to start crying, my mother finally passed. Yeah. And, um, and it was, we were getting my son, my eldest son, uh, baptized the following week. So she did, passed away on the 18th of December and um, on the 20th we were we, it was my son James's christening which she was adamant about and you know because you know you've got to get that baby baptized yeah. you know he won't go to heaven and, and, and you know all that cr crazy stuff that gets said around around religions and everything but she like I said she was a very devout person but I still um I pray to St Jude um, it's my one of my names I'm uh, my confirmation name is Francis, after St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, my middle name is, is Jude, after St. Jude, the patron saint of mm. hopeless cases, who I call upon often. Uh, I, I, something that I st I've started doing over the last sort of 10 years is I, I used to think I was asking all the time. I was asking to bless this person, this person, yeah. Yeah, please keep my mum on alive and all of that stuff. Mm. But I just now have to remember to say thank you. Mm. And in the morning, just to say a little prayer of gratitude. It, it's, you know, some days, I mean, this has been a horrid year. I mean, COVID has kicked my ass this year. Mm. I, I spent 18 months working through it, was really lucky. And now it's, it's, it's really, really like, affecting you know uh it's affecting everyone yes. i think really really badly now and so so this lends us to perhaps a more you know a simpler um festivities and and the sense of family and the prayer that we we, are, we don't have to isolate and that people are you know are able to see their loved ones um, yeah. But I think it's, for, it, it's it's bringing it back to its bare bones, and that's not such a bad thing. Not at all. I, I really like what you said about your your prayer moving away from asking for something and, and, and giving you. thanks. And I think that's a wholesome message that we can all learn from. Yeah. So, Patsy, I just want to say thank you for sharing your Christmas with us. It's oh. been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, you have too. I'm so so intrigued to meet you. So, thank you for having me. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Coming up after the break, we've got some really amazing guests who are doing some really, really fantastic charity work this Christmas. Stay tuned, back after this. The Shepherds and the Angels. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. But quite often, they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. The visit of the wise men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened. Herod secretly called for the wise men and sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search for the child and bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. They set out and there ahead of them went the star until, until it stopped over the place where the child was. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Then, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Welcome back. Coming up next, we have Neville Kurt-Smith, who is the director of Aid to the Church in Need. Neville, Aid to the Church in Need is a worldwide organization, I understand. And you spend a lot of time in the Middle East supporting Christians who are incredibly persecuted out there. What is the image? What's the state of things out there at the moment? Well, I think many of the Christians in the Middle East feel forgotten by the West, if not even betrayed at times. The, the camera has moved on from what's taken place in Syria, indeed from Iraq, but the Christians left behind, those who stayed and those who've tried to return, feel really that governments and others have not taken any notice of them and are not engaging with them. And aid to the Church in Need is a pontifical foundation, a charity with 23 offices around the world. I've run the UK office for 30 years. I've had the privilege of traveling to Iraq, to Lebanon, to Egypt, and I've met people who've been bombed in churches. I've met people who've been driven out of their homes, who've seen their homes destroyed by Islamist fundamentalists. Um, and their one cry is really for, to be heard, to be prayed for, first of all, and to be heard. And it's fallen on the likes of aid to the church in need, really, to help these Christian communities. Well, that's a good message to start on because we can all pray for them and support them in that way. Uh, has all of this trauma strengthened their faith? Well, I find it quite extraordinary and personally very encouraging. I, I remember talking 10 minutes from where ISIS were at that stage in Iraq to a lady sitting on the ground and sheltering from the sun, 89-year-old lady. And I had to have a translation. She was speaking in Aramaic. Mm our Lord's language. And she'd said something as we walked past and she said, I am praying for you. Will you pray for me? Yeah. And she had fled with her family from ISIS yeah. to this safety, but it wasn't, will you pray? It was, mm -hmm. I am praying for you, that unity in prayer. And I remember um, a girl, Naraman, with seven of her family in a tiny room. Again, they'd fled from ISIS. Mm -hmm. And I looked around this room and she spoke perfect English. She was highly educated um, from the University of Mosul. And, and I looked and I said, how have you got any, do you have any hope? And she said, yeah. She looked at me stunned, of course we have hope. We have hope in Jesus, we are Christians. And I think for us as Christians, that's a call to go back to the basic hope of Christ, the light shining in the darkness, to proclaim that here, to support Christians who are suffering elsewhere, mm. and to look to the love of God that love born for each and every one of us and to speak with hope to all people. 
Neville, I think that's a fantastic place to end. We could argue that this is a dark time at the moment, so we should all be looking for that light and search for yeah. faith, hope, and love. Absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing your Christmas. Thank you, Calvin. It's been a pleasure. God bless. Yeah. That was Neville from Aid to the Church in Need. Coming up now is Emanuela Russo from Sant Edigio. Emanuela, can you talk us through some of the important work that Sant Edigio is doing? Absolutely. So Sant Edigio is in over 70 countries in the world. Uh, the members are just regular people uh, in, uh, and we're a lay community uh, of 70,000 people spread across the world. Here in London, we are going out in the streets and being with people who are vulnerable, marginalized people living in the streets and also older people who are lonely. Uh, we also are in touch with different care homes and we try to befriend and support anyone in need. And what really struck me about your charity work is that you do a special thing around Christmas, don't you, in providing Christmas meals for people. How does that work? Yeah, so we provide Christmas meals uh, which obviously have a particular characteristic because we want to be able to give not just a meal but a smile mm. and a gift, a personalized gift. So anyone can show up, no one can has to register in any particular way. Uh, we just want to share the joy of Christmas with others. And the way it works is you come, you get a meal, you exchange a few words with somebody, then you get a present. And a lot of people don't expect the present, mm. especially the fact that we write down their names. And so for us, it's very important because it makes you very personal. Mm. And a lot of, well, some people actually say, I, I didn't expect that. And they say, are you sure this is for me? Mm. And so it's a way for us to say, yes, it is for you. This is how we want to live Christmas with one another. All right, so it's kind of a reminder that everyone is cared for. It is a reminder that everyone is cared for and that we can create a Christmas for all right. if all of us come together. Emanuela, what does Christmas mean to you? To me, Christmas means sharing a joy that I feel in my heart. I feel loved especially at Christmas, and therefore I want to share and in as much as I can expand that joy with others. Uh, it means that really everyone is loved and there is an inclusivity about that that we can't forget. Okay, I like that. But where does God come into that for you? That's a really lovely question. I think everybody has their own relationship with God and in my particular case, uh, the, there is something that I remember every, every Christmas in a very different way, just a slightly different way every year, uh, which is uh, the Acts of the Apostles. There is more joy in giving than, in, than there is in receiving. Mm. And to me, uh, that's where God comes into play. That's how God uh, enhances everything that I, um, that I see around me, but mainly the relationships that we all have and and form and these relationships can be with friends with family but they can also be with people that we might not expect that come into our lives like people living in the streets older people and uh, really anyone who feels marginalized and might experience a time of loneliness right and obviously loneliness has become much more of an issue, a prevalent issue this uh, last 18 months or so. How can people help? How can people support your charity, what you're doing and help, even if they can't get in touch with your charity, how can they help lonely people in our society? I think it is important to lend an ear to mm. anyone. You know, just listening to somebody might actually mean the world to them. You don't know how many times that person has been talked to and you know, London is a big city, in every single big city, sometimes we get lost in, you know, what we do and our work and our bubble. Mm. And Christmas gives an opportunity for us to kind of come out of that shell and uh, meet another person. And in doing so, you are trying to put someone else in your heart mm. for that one day or one week, or maybe, you know, uh, the year as you go, go on. So it's it's really important. I think if anybody wants to help, have a chat with somebody uh, that you might think you wouldn't have otherwise had a chat to, with. That's a very lovely message, Emanuela. Thank you for sharing that and good luck with all of your charity work. Thank God you bless. very much. Thanks for, for me to be here. Thanks. And that is it from our very special Christmas special. 
Uh, I think it's, on one hand, it's quite sad that no other channel would dare to celebrate Christmas in an explicitly Christian way. But on the other hand, it's very pleasing, exciting that that's what GB News is here for. I'd like to thank you for tuning in and thank all of our amazing guests for making this so special. Um, I've been Calvin Robinson. I'm wishing you a very Merry Christmas. And to play us out, here is once again, St. Mary's Choir. To remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather.